Hitting it. Flat. You tell me why. <laughs> What's up, guys? Uh, welcome to the podcast. And we've got Don Yeager in the house. Good to see you, Don. Excited about this. You've got a book called Great Teams, 16 Things High-Performing Organizations Do Differently. You interviewed 100 and how many coaches? 110 coaches and, and leaders business in sports. Leaders. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In, in sports and And then another business, another right? couple dozen in business, right. So 100 of the top coaches in a lot of different sports, right. college football. Who are some of the coaches? So everybody from Mike Krzyzewski to Nick Saban to... Uh, Anson Dorrance, the women's soccer coach at North uh, Carolina, that's won 22 national championships. 22? Yeah, yeah. There's only been 29 national championships awarded in that in that wow. sport. He's won 22 of them. The guy's incredible. 22. Um, yeah, he's Mia Hamm. He's had everybody that we all remember as a sure. great women's player. Many many of them played for him. So. And you had, um, did you have the Connecticut basketball? Yeah, well? Gino Auriemma. It's been, it's just so it's been this amazing collection, kind of learning from the best leaders in sports, and then trying to. Uh, try to align what they are teaching about how to build sustained excellence mm. um, because that's what we all want, right? Yeah. We, want, we don't want to be good today and then bad tomorrow. We want to be good for the long haul. And then how do you combine that with what business leaders can teach us? And you have 16 different things that these top sports teams do differently in organizations. Right. What would you say was something through all these interviews, these great coaches, what was maybe one or two things that you thought like, wow, I really didn't think they would say this and that that was a common theme in a lot of them? Yeah, number one was the one that really stood out to me was the, the idea that the best teams, the best organizations um, have a sense of purpose, but they don't just they don't just know who they're in service of, right? Because we've all heard that. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a pretty common theme today. Most companies or most people want to feel like they've got but these folks actually feel it, right? And they create opportunities to feel it. How do you create an um, opportunity to feel as opposed to just knowing? Sure, that's, that's the great question. So Mike Krzyzewski is one of those people that was so fascinating to me about how he did this. Guy takes over USA Basketball, right? Our Olympic team, Kobe Bryant. Um, and, uh, and what he discovered when he took over the team was that they had amazing talent, but they weren't all necessarily as excited about playing for their country as they mm -hmm. were playing for Nike, you know, because Nike paid them sometimes to, to right. wear their shoes in international competition. So his concern was, how do I make them fired up about playing for, for Team USA? With all these big egos right. and... Think about all the money, all the egos, and, and, and most of them have been the best ever in everything they've ever done, and now you're asking them to be part of a team. So he started, he said, you know what, I'll introduce them to other people who wear the letters USA on their chest, but for a different reason. And he started bringing in wounded warriors. Mm. He started taking them to to sit in military bases and and, inter, and and eat and live with people who service people who mm. were wearing uh, the letters USA on their chest. And he wanted them to realize that it, by extension, those were their teammates, right? That for the time you get to wear USA on your chest, you are their teammate. Wow. Don't let them down. Wow. And the capper for it was he took the team. Uh, before the 2012 Olympics, he took the team to Arlington National Cemetery. And uh, and the, the day began with Kobe and LeBron and Kevin Durant uh, presenting the wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Amazing, right? And then shortly after that, Martin Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, asked our players to walk with him through Arlington. And as he's taking them through Arlington, he's telling them stories about the men and women who were buried there. And then he said, let me take you a little further. And he takes them to this section 60 at Arlington Cemetery where the freshest graves are there. Wow. Right? The young men and women from Iraq and Afghanistan. And as they're standing there, you know, among all these amazing heroic stories, Coach Krzyzewski notices a young man standing about 100 feet away who is wearing civilian clothes, but he's got a crew cut. And he, he goes over and he asks the young man, uh, and the young man is taking pictures out of a backpack and laying them down at grave sites. And coach says, yeah, sir, would you, my name is Mike Krzyzewski, would you mind telling me what you're doing here today? And he said, um, this was my team. Wow. And he said, I, I'm here today kind of celebrating them. I'm putting out pictures of me and them in better days. And coach invites this young man to come over and talk to this collection of multimillionaire athletes. Hmm about what it meant to wear the letters USA wow, on their chest. That's pretty cool. And that sense of purpose, he created 
a feel it moment. That's what he calls them, right? A moment when you feel like I'm connected to something bigger than me. And we all play better when we're mm -hmm. connected to something bigger than ourselves. Right. If I'm only in it for me, if it's only about my numbers, you know what? I mean, I'll, I can perform, but boy, am I different if I feel like I'm performing for something bigger than myself. Mm. So how do we create those moments for ourselves? How do teams create those moments for themselves? And when they do, uh, the team shows up differently. Yeah. How would a business do that? You know, where uh, there's not a season maybe of play, but it's like every day we're just trying to make more money no. and sell products, it's a things like that, you know? So an example I have uh, that I got from the CEO, longtime CEO of Medtronic, right? Have you ever heard of Medtronic? They make yeah. medical devices that are implanted in people to oh, wow. keep them alive, okay. right? And, uh, and every year at their annual event, their big annual mm -hmm. conference, they bring in six families who are who are held together today because a Medtronic device is keeping one of them alive. Wow. And he gives the microphone to the six families to say thank you to the employees. And as they're standing there, he said every year some young woman takes the microphone, looks at his team and says, because you did what you promised, my daddy walked me down the aisle this That's summer. That's pretty cool. Right? And so the feel it moment was identifying who mm -hmm. you're in service of. And in their case, they're in service of these families, right? And if you know who you're in service of, then you ask them to share their story or in some way remind you that what you do matters. And if you do that, I mean, at the, at the end of that hour with those families, at Medtronic, they sit those families up in the back of the room with pictures like the rock stars and they mm -hmm. autograph them to all the employees. Cool. And the pictures hang all over the building because that's who they're in service they're in of. service of those individuals. Yeah. And if you're in service of somebody, you feel different about what you do every day. So it's more than just having a mission statement. Like that's the knowing, right? right? We know that we're, this is our mission and our purpose and our right. why, but how do you cultivate that feeling as often as possible? Yep. I'm assuming, you know, an annual event and having that feeling once is good, but trying to cultivate that weekly is probably even better. Right, and, and as you know, I mean, the greatest gap in human performance is the gap between knowing and doing, right? Uh -huh. And so, you know, it's one thing to, to have a statement on the wall saying, you know what, our job is to improve the, uh, the lives of, uh, you know, of our mm. customers or to whatever it might be. Hopefully, it's, hopefully the only thing on the statement is not to make more money for our shareholders. Because right. yeah, if that's yeah. all that's on there, it's hard. it's hard to get excited about coming yeah. to work every day. Yeah. So it is this, uh, you know, if you can know that there's someone you're in service of, man, you just mm. feel different about doing what yeah. you do. Wow. You know, I know your purpose. I mean, I know from having followed you for so many years, this is... Uh, um, you and I were talking before we got on, right? I mean, how cool yeah. this has been to watch your yeah, it's progression. Fun. Every week we, we share the testimonials of people who've gotten out of a, a toxic relationship, who've right. lost the weight, who started pursuing their, their dreams. And mm -hmm. for me, that's what excites me. It's yeah. just even those like little moments. But I promise it doesn't just excite you. It excites right. everybody on your team yeah. to know that, uh, that, that, that your work is having impact because then by extension their work is having impact. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody gets to go to work, gets to go home differently, right? Gets to come exactly. to work differently. <clears throat> because you that's believe it. there's somebody out there that's being made, the difference is being made because of what you do. So finding ways to cultivate that feeling moments, right? Correct. Is that what you call them? Yes, feel it moments. Feel so moments. I'm on the national board of Make-A-Wish. Right? It's, um, I love Make-A-Wish, my yeah, favorite charity. You feel it every time. Yes, but we do every board meeting, every meeting at Make-A-Wish opens with what they call a mission moment, which is where a family or a story of a family is shared with us who got their wish. The, the, kid, the child got their wish, but the family was impacted. Mm. Now you open your conversation about what you're gonna do today with what you're doing, how it impacts a family, I'll give you anything you ask me for that day. But so it, you know, my point is that I give you Medtronic as a business example. Yeah. Make a wish. We have mission moments. It's the same thing as Mike Shashevsky's feel it moments. It's huh. we're remembering who we're there for. And if you can make that a more reliable piece of your conversation, you you just come to work differently. Right? How often should we be having that conversation? How often should we be trying to I, Does it I, get worn out if you it, say it every day and try to create those moments? Probably would get worn out if you said it every day, but I, but I don't think it, it hurts you to do it monthly, mm -hmm. you know, to, on a monthly basis. Be reminded, what you do today matters, and it matters to somebody, you know. Mm -hmm. And by the way, here's a, here's a somebody, because it's easy to say it matters to somebody, 
it's more complicated and more difficult to ignore if I can put a face yeah. with that conversation. And if we can do that, man, we just we all feel better about what mm-hmm. we get a chance to do, and our lives are improved, our teams are improved, and um, and it, anyway, so it was the number one answer that came up among these extraordinary team builders was that they took that sense of purpose and they made it come to life. And when you can do that, I mean, all of us want to have a sense of purpose, but when you can make it come to life, it's impossible to ignore. Mm. And Nick Saban was the same way. He had similar types of experiences. Absolutely. Tom Izzo at Michigan State Mm -hmm. talked a lot. Now, for him, his whole thing was don't cheat the bloodlines, right? We have had so many players who created the opportunity for you to become, to wear a Michigan State uniform with pride. Don't cheat the bloodlines, right? That was his thing. That's his thing. face to the people that came before you. Correct. And then he would bring the people who came before you in to talk. And now you're you're looking at Magic Johnson. Going, do I really want to cheat Let Magic Johnson? Yeah, yeah. Right, and so uh, it, it's a different form for everybody, but it's it's that constant sense that that we are different and better if we have a um, if we have someone that we're that we're performing for. That's cool. Right? Yeah, that yeah. we matter to. Yeah, whether you're a sports or a business team. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the next thing you talk about, so finding that purpose and having those feel it moments is crucial if you want to be a high performing team. Yes. Now, I'm not saying that if you do that, you will be high performing though, because no. there's still a lot of other things. You, need. you have to have yes. talent, you have a, lot of, have a lot of other things, but uh, the next thing you talk about is effective management and that they've developed great leaders. It's challenging to develop great leaders. It is. It's hard to find a great leader who is willing to continue to grow and not always make it about them, but make it about the mission and the team, that right? So true. That, but but that's where you. That's again. That's another bright line. That's so. What I was looking for while writing this book was what are the bright lines? What are the things that separate the good from the great? And what you find is in the great, they are constantly developing the next generation. They're constantly looking mm-hmm. at the people who will take the reins behind them, right? So it's not just not about, relying on one person, right? But like how we gonna develop more leaders, right? Because at the end of the day. Everything transitions, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, by nothing's and large, yeah. nothing's permanent, right? And if that's true, then how how ready are you for the transition? And that, and you're only ready if you're in the development of that next generation. The thing that was fascinating in this piece was that most of these great teams don't just focus on what kind of leader we are. We've all taken most of us who have ever done any kind of leadership development. Mm-hmm. Have probably taken one of those Myers Briggs yeah, or one of those. You know, I'm a I'm a purple, you know, yeah, giraffe, yeah, yeah. Or whatever it is, right? And you're given something that tells you what you are uh-huh. in the animal kingdom. <laughs> and what this says, what the what the great ones taught me was, the second piece of it was understanding what kind of leader your team needed you to be. So you may be a purple giraffe, but your team needs a pink rhino today, right? Because today is a really in bad day yeah. in the in the history of your company. And they need a command and control leader. They need someone who, and that's not how you're wired. How do you become the leader your team needs? Mm. And that's one of the challenges. A lot of folks say, uh, my team is going to count on me to be a consistent. I'm going to be this way every day. Not always. Sometimes your team needs you as a leader to actually step in and be the leader they need. Not, not the leader you're most comfortable being. Right. Shift. Shift. And style, can yeah. you shift your leadership style if you can? you find uh, that you have the opportunity for greater, again, sustained excellence. Have you seen that with uh, these you know, big college football coaches or Krzyzewski, that they're able to shift? Or do they lead with a, uh, a certain personality type most of the time? Look at Krzyzewski, you know, back when he had his amazing run with Grant Hill and, and, and Christian mm-hmm. Leitner. I mean, all of those were players who were committed to staying at Duke for four years, right? Because that was his model back then. Well, the model changed. Yeah. Now he's winning championships with guys who are there for six months, right? Yeah. You know, they're on campus for you know for six months. So how do you you have to we we all have to be, and he's in his seventies adjusting wow. like that, right? 70s? You know, I think he's right at seventy wow. right now. But there's a guy who is is figured out. You know, he's constantly adjusting who he is uh, to give him the opportunity to be successful wow. next year as well. Innovating, reinventing, Correct. reinventing. That's the best word, we yeah. Wow, okay. So effective management, effective leadership. Um, and you talk about creating and maintaining depth. What does that mean? Well, you know, it's important to recruit talent, right? It's a, but it's more important to recruit uh, the, the talent that fits your culture. So, you know, that's one of the great questions here. What is your culture? A lot of people don't 
No. Um, one of the things that was fascinating here is that uh, everybody says that the culture of your organization, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a, a five-person shop or a mm -hmm. fifty or five million company, yeah. a person company, there's a culture to your organization, and the culture of your team is going to happen either by design or default, right? It's either going to happen because you because you choose these are the things we're going to value, and these are the things we're going to reward, and this is the these are the things we're going to punish, right? Mm -hmm. That's your that's truly your culture is what what falls in those categories. So it's either going to be by design or it's just going to happen by accident. And no great team lets anything happen by accident, mm -hmm. right? They're designing things. So these teams are then developing the recruiting to fit what will work for them, right? What what will flourish in the culture that they have yeah. created. And and once you once you've done that, then your job is to develop them, right? Is to actually say for everybody on our team, how do I make you better tomorrow than you are today? And if you're not thinking about that, both as an employer and an employee, right? If I'm not thinking every day, how do I, how do I add to who I am so that I'm a better me tomorrow? At the end of the day, you're not, you're not, you're not developing, mm. which is the, the line that keeps you from being available when promotions or opportunities are out there. Right. So what's the key there is to continue to Develop what specifically? It's to, it's to look and there's a combination of your professional skill set, right? Here's what our here's what our our team needs us to be, and then your personal skill set. Like, how can I make sure I'm, I'm I'm being more thoughtful on you know on the way I'm uh, I'm I'm interacting with others or you know I mean what are my what energy, is, my attitude, correct? My, yeah, sure all the things you on know, time, being exactly. my word, all these things. Yeah, and so as you build those things, you create for yourself. And you also talk about having an effective roadmap. Uh, and is that just kind of like, you know, for me in sports, at the beginning of every football season, the coach would say, okay, what do we want to achieve? Right. What's the goal for the next three months? Right. And we used to have a chalkboard back in the day. And we would say... We Dude, you were a chalkboard guy? Chalkboard you guy. You were not old enough to... Anyway, yeah, just yeah, still, yeah. They didn't have whiteboards back then. <laughs> uh, 1996, yeah. Um, and we would say, well, here's what we want to achieve as a right. collectively as a team. Right. You know? And then it would just be up on the board. Mm -hmm. And then every day... Uh, and then every week you would say, okay, we need to achieve these things each week. And right, in order to get to, to that. Yeah. Right, and then you, right, exactly. So there's this roadmap that yeah. allows you to say, I mean, Coach Wooden had his pyramid of success, uh -huh. right? Um, Pat Summit, you know, had her had her ten laws. I mean, all the great ones have something that says we're going to work on the development in these areas to get to the peak, right? Mm -hmm. To the to the apex. What is that? What's that apex for all? Of it? And but breaking it down and then creating this roadmap for us that. Um, is well defined. Too, too many of them are they're scrambling, right? We're right. in a, we're in scramble mode all the time. The best teams aren't on scramble mode because they they know what they have to build upon to get where they want to get. Mm. How do we develop that map if we don't know how to start it? Well, I think a big piece of it is is reverse engineering it, right? Yeah. It's, you, it's what you Here's what you goal. talked about, right? Now, now all right, it's it's like anything else. I want to. I want to run a you know a, a seven minute mile, right? Yeah. Well, I got to first I got to figure out when I can run an eight minute mile, yeah, exactly. I, right? You got to work it backwards, right? In order to be able to do those things, uh, everything has to has to ultimately become bite sized uh -huh. in order for it to be in one order day at a time. Correct. We we used to do you know in, in practice we would have a schedule before I'd get into the locker room I'd see the schedule on my locker of like every ten minutes what mm -hmm. we were doing. Mm -hmm. And structuring it and organizing it so we knew when the water break was. We knew when we were stretching. Like it wasn't just okay, three hours of practice, show up on the field, right? Throw the ball around. It was so detailed. But what's so powerful about what you're sharing right there is that it, many coaches have those very detailed practice plans, but they don't share them with the players. They so do internally with the coaches. Correct. And they look at their thing, and the players are all wondering, like, well, what am I doing? what's the next ten minutes going to be like? The idea that your coach did that—that's that's. that's that's strong, right? And that's where, uh, again, I think that's a real that that in, that uh, engenders trust. Mm -hmm. It creates uh, it creates energy within the team because you know what's coming next. Right. All of those things come down to our ability uh, to have direct communication with those people who are making decisions that will impact who we're, what we'll yeah. get to be today. Do you see that with a lot of the top coaches that they have a schedule as well and they give it to the players? Yes. And that kind of yeah, yeah. yeah. Coach Wooden was master. Like Coach Wooden would actually go through and do his entire season 
he'd have a practice plan for every day of the season. No way. So it would explain his development, what he was intending to develop in them every day of the season. And uh, yeah, his practice plans were on these little six by eight cards. And, uh, and then he would have them duplicated and, and every manager would get one, every player no would get way. one, so they would know what was expected of them for the, you, you know what your development's gonna look like. And the willingness to share information, it, it separates good leaders from, uh, great leaders from good, right? And, um, and so I think that's a really, hmm. uh, that's, that's powerful that you had that, that experience. How, what could a, a CEO or a leader or manager in a company do to effectively communicate information better to their employees or teams or? My guess is that almost anybody that's listening to you, because I, I know who your audience is, could probably say lots, right? Yeah. You could do lots better. To, but one of the things that, that is that's really important is that um, is the communication as often and as um, as you're capable of doing this, um, explains why we're doing things. Mm-hmm. It used to be that you could just tell people to do things, we're right? Just it. do yeah. it, right? Yeah. It's, it's like my dad with my with me, right? I don't, just do it. Don't just do it. Exactly. Don't, I'm ask, not, questions. don't ask questions. Just do it. Today, um, especially in the generations we're we're working with, there today, needs to be a why. There needs to be a purpose. Correct. Yeah. It has to be. Uh, we're doing it for this reason, and so I mean. Even in my little speaking business, right? I mean, I have a pie chart that explains to why if you do this, then this happens, and you know, mm. and, and then I get to go over with the team that works for me, so that we remember that all these little piece parts have to flow in order to get the chance to do it all over again, right? Yeah. Um, and keep but reaching our, our goals, on right? Impact, yeah. yeah. And so huh. everything has to the, the ability to communicate, not just that we're doing something, but here's how it plays into what we are attempting to achieve. Big difference. What's this pie chart thing you have? What is that? Well, for me, it actually looks and says, you know, a, a, a speech is booked. All right now, here's what we have to do to execute, on, to execute that. on that speech, so that we have done everything that will make that client look and say, man, I want to have that guy back again, right? But it only if if at any place in this we break down, they're going, my gosh, that guy was a pain in the behind. Right. And if we can, and we don't want to be that, our goal is to- Make it to, as seamless as possible, correct. as efficient, as powerful, yeah. if, if they feel like they have just, they've just done business with a pro, they want to do business yeah. again. And they'll recommend you to other people. Yeah. Correct. How many speeches are you doing a year? 70 right 70. now, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Machine. So, well, it's turned into my, I love telling stories to, yeah. well, I mean, we're storytellers at our heart, right? Um, but I love doing it. Live audiences are a lot of fun wow. because you get the chance to get immediate feedback. Yeah, like how is somebody, is that story resonating it's with them? Yeah. Is, it, is it impacting them? You know, it's interesting, we, just, we were talking about Kobe. When I, when I just interviewed him, I said, what's your vision moving forward? What's like your goal in life moving forward after you've had this amazing 20 year career? Can you guess what he said? Storyteller. That's what he said. He yeah. said, I wanna be a great storyteller. Yeah. Because that's what changes the world. Yep. I was like, wow. Didn't know that's what was going to be his answer, but yeah, no, I, 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 the chances you know, we're talking. We, 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 yeah, we, inter- I interviewed him a couple of years ago before he, actually before he'd retired, and and he actually said the same thing. That it's he crazy, was, right? Yeah, but I, I love that he recognized how does the world move? The world moves around stories, right? The best storytellers win, mm-hmm. right? They win in business, uh, they win in sports, they win. I mean, the best storytellers win. And um, and so we have to, and we can move people through story in ways that will never move them through statistics. Mm-hmm. Wow, um, you're talking about activating efficiency. So how do we become more efficient when there's lots of again egos, desires, dreams, personal breakdowns with families, like all these things happening with each individual on a team? How do we bring it all together? to keep people on track and efficient in the process. I, I, you, the great point in what you just said there is the key to a lot of that is do, uh, does the team, or especially the leaders in the team, do they know their team well enough to know what's happening, what's happening in someone's life? Because if, if, if I know that there's something going on at home uh, that, and, and you're running a little bit late for several days in a row, I'm, I'm not going to call you in, and I mean, if, if you have a heart, you're not calling someone in, and you're yeah. and, and taking them out, right? You're um, you're recognized. You you might even use that as an opportunity to kind of engage and attempt to be helpful in some way. But 
but it's about knowing your people. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, you know, I've watched some of your work recently, and I know you're, you're asking a lot of great questions around, you know, movements and things happening in, our, in, in the workplace. Right. And it gets harder in, with all of that to get to, sometimes people will use that as a reason not to know others. Um, hmm. But I don't think we can if we want to create engaged, humane team. workplaces, yeah. right? Great teams. Uh, you have to, I mean, I love Greg Popovich at the Spurs. A couple of years ago, they're in the NBA Finals, right? And it was, uh, and so, you know, teams gathered and they're all thinking they're going to get something really big. And Popovich uh, points out that one of their players, a backup point guard, is from Australia. And that, and he's an indigenous Australian. And that particular day in the history of Australia was an important day to his people. Wow. And so instead of taking time to talk about a game plan, he asked this player to share what this day means in the history of his people mm. with his teammates. You know what? I mean, uh, everybody got, had, a, had a little different insight in who they were playing with now. And Popovich made a point. Hmm. You know what? Yes, winning's important, but knowing each other is really important. We will win better if we know each other better. That's true. Right? We will do more for each other if we know each other better. So how do you? There's some great content in some of the neat ways that you're you're asking these questions right now about workplace to get into this discussion. How do we get yeah. to know each other and not bump up against lines that that yeah. are awkward? Yeah. I wonder how did he get to know Kawhi Leonard though. That's some, you know, that's the problem. Some people yeah, won't let you in, right? Oh, interesting. And no matter how hard you try, right? And and I I don't know Kawhi Leonard, yeah. But I know that's the that's the word that is the what people have said about him. Yeah, word that he is so closed off. He has this this collection of seven people that really surround him, and you know, and penetrating that seven is really tough. And um, wow. and it's crazy when you can pay somebody millions of dollars and not penetrate, right? Crazy. Um, but. Yeah. Uh, no, this is, but the, the whole concept here, and this is what I've loved about getting a chance to both do the book and then get it to talk about it with people yeah. like you, is that we're talking about teams, but we're really talking about people, yeah. right? And we are the people, and the, the, those who are watching, you know, they're the, they're the cogs that make this whole thing possible, right? Mm. They're, the, they're the engine that fuels a great team. How do they contribute? How do they make the most of their opportunities? Yeah. And uh, it's exciting, exciting yeah, conversation. That's cool. Uh, and then the pillar four, you talk about mutual direction. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's it's the idea that, and we just talked about Kawhi Leonard, right? I mean, sometimes you can have a lot of people with a lot of different agendas. How do you pull agendas together? How do you get? Um, and one of the most important pieces of that is open and and direct lines of communication. The belief that. I can talk to you about things because um, yeah. because I believe you have the team's best interest in mind, and we're we're willing to do the right thing, and so that that key is you know that that ability, and then finally at the end of this entire lesson plan, what was interesting was the best teams are always worried about how do we do it again next year, right? Because right. the greatest predictor of failure is success. The second you become mm. successful, you stop doing the things that down. got you there. Yeah. Right? Mike Ditka used to say, on the way to the top, it was all about we. And then we got to the top, and it was all about me. Right? He said, everybody in the building, when the Chicago Bears won the, world, won, won the, uh, the, the Super Bowl, everybody in the building, including the secretary, wanted a raise because they were responsible. Right? And, uh, and so how do, you keep, how do you keep momentum even after success? You and I had a great how do dinner. You do that? Well, a big piece of it is recognizing what got you there, right? What got you there, yeah. and then continuing to reward people and acknowledge people who are doing those things mm. because people want, by and large, within most organizations, they want to be acknowledged. And more so, through uh, a verbal acknowledgement or monetary acknowledgement. There's a combination. It's it's interesting, uh, you know. There's a, there's a guy out there named Gary Chapman. You probably know Gary of Five Love Languages, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where he talks huge about that book. huge book. He, he did a similar book about business and how there are five languages that people speak at work. Really? And that most of us 
don't know what each other's language is, right? We, th I'm thinking, I'll walk in and drop a thousand dollars on you, and you'll be happy because you just that. got. But that may not be what you're looking for. What you wanted me was for me to praise you in front of the team. So just as my wife and I did five love languages, my team and I did this five, these love, this languages at work conversation, so that I could know what everybody who works for me, how they respond. Mm. So it's it's a different answer for every employee. And it's and that's the complicated yeah. aspect of building a great team. So you got to take the Myers Briggs test. That's yeah, right. <laughs> and become a purple yeah, purple, purple elephant purple or whatever it is, purple yeah. monkey. No, so. you talk about also speaking the same language, and that all great teams have a, a language that they speak. Yes. What does that mean? Well, it it's it's about um, so that one that example I drew uh, primarily from a really long conversation with Pete Carroll mm. in Seattle, right, the Seattle Seahawks. And he talked a lot about the importance of having um, consistent languaging. And so all of his leaders, um, they know that one of the things they don't do is they don't berate you when you make a mistake, right? At your wide receiver, you go out, you drop a pass. All the time. I know. It's the worst. And you drop a pass. And then you come to the sidelines. What and what is the coach? Yeah. Like you wanted Catch the to, ball. Like you wanted to drop a pass. Right, exactly. Like you didn't know that catching the ball was what you were being right. paid to do, yeah. right? So what he said was, why is that our conversation point? Mm. Why, when someone comes to the sideline, are we yelling those things? Why instead are we not having a conversation around, what did we talk to you about earlier today, about when that pass comes, extend your left arm a little yeah, further yeah. than your right, create the cradling position. I mean, you know, Whatever it is that you the have language. taught, yeah. the language, use that language consistently as opposed to going off track and because the emotion of the moment takes you in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And when you start seeing teams that have that ability, Steve Kerr is masterful at this, yeah. right? These guys, they, did, they, they, they speak differently to their teams than those coaches who are getting fired every other year, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have figured out that the way we communicate with each other has so much to do with what we'll get in the end. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting to see certain coaching styles, and it seems like the yelling, screaming coaching style is leaving it with the greatest teams, right? You don't see many of the best coaches anymore who sustain... Crabbed face masks. You don't and see that, that anymore. Right? No, you don't. Exactly. And maybe that worked in the past sometimes, but you don't see the greatest people over time continue to live that way. Correct. It seems exhausting, too. Yeah. Constantly and, reacting and screaming. And and, and think about what it, what it does... Let's, let's translate it into a workplace, right? If you have to come to work every day on eggshells, wondering, what am I going to get? Like, are they going to, is something, did they have a, you know, is they, are, are they having a bad day at home that they're going to bring into the office place and take out on me? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that willingness, you're right, that understanding that, no, the best leaders get that uh, consistency and message, right? If I want to be uplifting to you, I need to be uplifting to you as often as I can be, mm -hmm. right? There may be days I have to, as John Wooden said, sometimes the, the pat on the back is a little lower, a little harder, right? <laughs> but it's but it's about how do you how do you uh, how do you get the most from people, mm. and you don't get it by <clears throat> by doing some of the things that used to be done. What was the greatest uh, three greatest lessons you learned from John from Wooden? So the number one uh, I, I loved he taught me a lot about um, the value of my inner circle. Um, one day when I was with him, he actually took a sheet of paper. And he drew two lines down this, the, the page. And he said, I want you to take that first column down and I want you to write down the five people you spend your most time with at work. And then the middle column, the five people you spend your most time with in your personal life. Mm -hmm. And the third column would be the five people you give your time to in some social environment, whether it's a, um, you know, whether it's a, uh, some kind of a charity or whatever it might be, right? A church. I said, look, at, look tonight at those 15 names and ask yourself, one by one, are they going where you're going? Are they encouraging you to where you want to be, or are they an anchor to you? Mm -hmm. Are they taking you down? <clears throat> Every time you talk to them, you got to listen to 30 minutes of drama. He said, if they're an anchor, scratch them from the list mm. and find a new five. And he said, you will never outperform your inner circle. And if you want to be your very best, constantly, constantly govern your inner circle. Mm, that's powerful. Make sure you're putting the right people around you mm -hmm. because that's where you'll go. That's powerful. So that was number one. So inner circle. Inner circle. Second was he talked about the, the importance, we referred to it earlier, but 
He said, make each day your masterpiece, right? Every day is my favorite quote from John Wood. Because every day is a challenge to create a masterpiece. Can you? It's hard. Right? It's hard to create a masterpiece day. Every day. Every day. But if you can focus only on creating today's masterpiece and do it again tomorrow, and the day after that, you can come up with I mean, incredible things can happen, right? Multipliers. But most of us are worried about what am I going to do tomorrow mm. and the next day and the next day. And he's saying, be a masterpiece today. Be the architect of your masterpiece. And I love that because it reminds me to be, to be present and to be focused in everything I do. And when I do that, things turn out better. Yeah. Things turn out better. Yeah. And then finally, you know, Coach Wooden, talk, he, he used to say, you cannot live a perfect day without doing something for someone who cannot repay you. So constantly quote. make a day, make it, make a, find something every day, someone every day, who you can pick up or who you can be, and, and it may be simple, it may be yeah. a door, it may be a doorman or a, yeah. you know, a person at, an, at, at the airport or wherever it might be, that you get a chance uh, find that somebody every day who can give you nothing in return and do something special for them, whatever that would look like. That's one of my favorite things to do every day is just <sighs> to smile at someone, give them a high five, just simple small things like you said, just ask a question, ask right. them how they're doing. It doesn't have to be some grand gesture. Right. But like how can you transfer energy from yourself to lift someone else up? Right. And you're asking how they're doing and then you're listening Absolutely, to their answer. Yeah. Because the challenge is a lot of people ask, how are you doing? And then they're, you know, immediately yeah. the head's turned and they're on it, or they're looking over your shoulder the next person. Mm. And at the end of the day, you're doing something for someone yeah. if you truly engage and give them of yourself. Besides Wooden, who is the most uh, inspiring coach in your mind of all sports um, that you've had time to connect gosh. with? It would have to be Krzyzewski. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just really... I, I'm, you uh, played with him at Duke. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he has an old man's basketball camp that uh, that I that I get a chance to go to every year. Uh, cool. It is my wife's gift to me every year for That's Christmas. Cool. I got to do that one year too. You should I'm absolutely gonna, come. It's it summer is, or what is it's, that? Uh, it's right at the end of May every year. Yeah, I got to try yeah. that sometime. Yeah. Are you there this year? Yeah. yeah. So one one week or weekend? it's five days. Yeah. Was Jesse there too? Or Jesse Hitzler no? was there. Yeah, it's an amazing collection of wow. old guys who believe they still have candy. <laughs> <laughs> you just play and, basketball and all day. You play basketball, yeah, two full court games a day on Cameron Indoor Stadium. Right? No How way. cool is that? Um, full court. Full court with your with with all of his old players as your coaches. No so way. So it's all Grant Hill, and Grant Hill, all those guys all are coaches. Yes. No way. Oh no, yeah. It's now they don't all come every year, but I've had Grant as a coach before. And they're amazing in the way they engage and how much fun it is. It, yeah. yeah, it's just great. How many right? teams are there? Uh, between eight and ten, but of ten guys. On, ten guys. Yeah, yeah. So, so you all get the same uh, time playing. Yep. And yep. Yeah. Now, I mean, toward the end of the game, the better players are always <laughs> on the court, the which is the key, right? <laughs> but you, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, but Krzyzewski does these things because, like, I mean, again, the guy's just really, I think he's really smart. And that he brings all, I mean, the executive level talent that's at this game camp it's amazing. is crazy, right? I mean, these are, it's the owner of the Boston Celtics, right? It's the, the, the guys that bought the Boston, the Atlanta Hawks, you know, including yeah. Jesse, yeah. you know, many of them met at this camp, right? So these are all multi zillionaires. Right, it's a great network. But then he brings his old players back to, to so that they're now connected to all these business people, which is good for them, too, yeah, absolutely. right? Because they don't get to play forever. No. And so, but you're there, you know, last year we're sitting there, and then in walks Jason Tatum, right? You know, who had just lost in the NBA, you know, in the, in the quarterfinal. And, you know, he's there. And he's hanging out, you know, with you, kind of giving you a little bit of advice on. Yeah, do this. Do yeah, that. exactly. Well, I, I would love to do this if I had your skill. <laughs> I could right? jump. Exactly right. <laughs> if I could run, if I could yeah. shoot a three yeah. from right from ten half feet court, out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So. Oh man, that's cool. Um, what was the last thing that uh, Wooden said to you? So um, I had the chance. Probably my, my my last conversation with him was a couple of months before he passed, and. Um, uh, and we were talking, and he was, he, I think he was feeling weak, and so he kind of knew. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was, you know, I always worried, like, would it be the last time I'd see him, or what, what I should feel about that? And he. You were mentored by him for years. 12 right? years, yeah. 12 years. Yeah, wow. yeah, 12 years. We had a relationship every other month for 12 years. I flew here That's to amazing. spend a day with him. And, um, but he, yeah, in the conversation, the last one, he was. He was just talking about his wife. He talked about Nellie, his wife, a lot. And uh, she'd been past 25 years. 
Wow. And uh, but he wanted to, you know, he was, he talked about her as as a, as a living person every day, for the I mean, you know, if, and he he talked about his desire to he was looking forward to time with her oh, again. Wow, that's cool. And I thought, you know what, that's a pretty amazing perspective. Instead of trying to hang on for one more day, it's like you know what, what I'm wow. gonna get to see Nellie again. Twenty five years she passed earlier. Yeah. yeah. That's sad. Yeah. You know, he wrote her a love letter. Did I? Uh, every month, so she died on the 21st of the month, and uh, every month for 25 years, he sat down on the 21st and he wrote his wife a love letter. Oh my gosh. And there were these beautiful letters, and he, he would, um, several times my conversation with him occurred on the 21st day mm -hmm. of the month, so I would have to wait for him to handwrite these letters. And then he would fold them up, seal it go to the bedroom and he would set it on her side of the bed. Oh my gosh. And then he'd take last month's letter, put it in a box, and he did this every month for 25 years. And um, Where are those letters? Uh, his granddaughter has them. But no one's ever opened them, which is really cool. Because that's, I mean, that was his expression of love yeah. to his wife and everyone kind of recognizes, you know what, that's pretty cool wow. that somebody would do that. That should be like a movie or something, or what? a book one day. One day I asked him, I said, Coach, is there anything in those letters um, you wished you'd said to her when she was alive? And he said, all of it. Wow. He said, one of the great challenges we have is that we wait till someone's gone to tell them how much we love them. Mm. And he said, I regret that. He said, like, I don't have a lot of regrets in life, but I regret that I didn't say all of these things every day that I had a chance while she was with me. Wow. And I thought that's pretty powerful. Oh, what a pretty powerful lesson. And um, actually, started a neat tradition in our house. I started writing um, and giving my wife a box of love letters every year at Christmas that she gets to open every Friday. No way. Yeah. That's cool. Last last week she opened, or today, she opened letter 451. So for nine years, she's been getting these love letters. That's pretty and cool. It's, it's pretty awesome. That's cool. And it's a neat way for us to, uh, to, to, for me to constantly remind myself about little things I love about her. Mm, it's pretty cool. That's cool. I'm sure she loves that. Wow. Yeah. Um, what would you say are your uh, three truths? I don't know if I asked you this last time you were on, but three, no. truths, three things that you would leave behind if this is all you could leave behind. You've written nine New York Times bestsellers. Eleven now. Eleven? Actually, there was nine, nine here. I know. So I've had two since the, this two book came out two years ago. Eleven New York Times bestsellers. I've had two sellers. since then. Crazy. Um, you've interviewed every great athlete, every great coach, business leader, you've spoken at every venue in the world, it seems like. You've said a lot of stories, lessons, but what would be the three lessons you would want to leave behind if there was only three? If I could only pick three, one would be um, the power of forgiveness, mm. right? Understanding that if for us to really move forward, sometimes we have to move back and find those things we have to, we have to, uh, I mean, you and I have had conversations mm -hmm. around that, right? That's a um, that, that that ability to find within you the the um, the strength to forgive. So it's, hard. It's hard, but it's the most freeing thing you can do, right? It's and I work yeah. on it all the time. There's still things I'm struggling with mm -hmm. forgiving, right? That, um, but one would would certainly be the power of forgiveness. The second um, would be what the, what I was talking about earlier with Coach Wooden that you're only as good as that team around the people around you, mm -hmm. and I'm. I'm vigilant now. I used to be, you know, anybody that wanted time, just it was all good. Now I'm really vigilant about how do I protect my time, and how do I make sure it's shared most, um, most with people who I want in that circle, mm, right? That's cool. Um, and then, and then finally, I would say it's about charity. It's about trying to realize that what can you know, God's blessed us in so many ways, right? And you know, yeah. whatever your religious take on it is mm -hmm. recognizing blessings and, and yeah. the willingness to share them with others is um, is off the charts. I mean, what it does, as you said, when you're talking about just high-fiving somebody sometimes, how we share those those blessings yeah. is, a, um, is, a, is a complete, you have to do that in order to believe you've lived a masterpiece day. Yeah, that's right? cool. And you've been on the Make-A-Wish Foundation as on the board for On a the while. national board for four, um, the four years now. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's got to feel good. It's the most incredible, Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I again, I'm, not to disparage any other charity, to me it's the most incredible one out there. I mean, we get life, kids with life-threatening illnesses 
and they and they get a chance to pick a wish, and we it's make it happen. Pretty amazing, and we make it happen. It's pretty incredible. What's yeah. the coolest thing you've seen in the last four years? One of those wishes. Uh, so, you know, they kind of break it down into several areas, but to meet somebody, one of them was this really cool little girl who wanted to meet Tom Brady, and I got to go along. You got to go watch it. Watch it, and yeah, she was four years old. And she spent two and a half years in hospitals fighting cancer. Um, but she was cancer free that day. Wow. And she wanted to meet Tom Brady. And Tom Brady gave her the day of her life. It That's was the amazing. best. Yeah. And when you watch these things and you see how, again, it cost Tom Brady nothing but time, right? Yeah. Um, but that little girl will talk about that forever. Mm-hmm. Right? Her, you know, her mom will probably talk about it forever because the mom was a little more sw- smitten by Tom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, a little more smitten with Tom maybe than the little girl was. Sure, sure. But but it was this really cool. You just you watch these moments and you realize the impact we some are blessed to mm. blessed to make on others. Mm. That's cool. Very cool. Uh, make sure you guys get the book. Great teams. Check it out. Uh, Sixteen things high performing organizations do differently and sports teams and all that. Uh, go get the book. We'll have it linked up below. Um, where can we follow you online? Oh, thank you. Uh, just donyeager.com, D-O-N-Y-A-E-G-E-R.com. Although I own the other spelling, the social, uh, Instagram, Don Yeager, uh, LinkedIn, okay. Don Yeager, cool. uh, Twitter, Facebook, got it all. Y-A-E-G-E-R. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, but I actually, knowing that a lot of people misspell Jaeger to Y-E-A, I actually own the website, spelled the other way. Too. Really? That's right. Oh, that's good. Own, own the misspellings of that's your own smart. name. That's, that's right. So I that should have good. L-O-U-I-S as well. Exactly. L-U-I-S. Own good. them all. Own them that's all. That's great. Cost you nine bucks. And um, Actually, I already own the L-O-U-I-S. I'll sell it to you, though. Yeah, for nine bucks. <laughs> no, not for nine bucks, <laughs> <dude>. <laughs> Um, very cool. Well, again, make sure you guys get the book. Check it out uh, if you want to learn how to build your team and have a more impactful team. What's uh, what's your definition of greatness? Uh, so my you def- also wrote a book about greatness. I did write it. But in fact, so I was I was episode number seventeen for yes, you, yes, right? Yes. Uh, many many years On ago. Greatness. And, was right. Sixteen principles. Of what That's right. Sixteen characteristics of, yes. of greatness. Uh, so my definition is the uh, is the consistent pursuit of excellence, mm-hmm. right? That the truth is that greatness is a place we never really arrive. It's a place we should always aspire to be. Mm-hmm. And if you aspire to be it, if you work to be it, um, you know where you'll end up will be pretty darn great. Mm-hmm. Be pretty darn amazing. Yeah. People will, people will marvel at what you can achieve if you chase greatness. That's it. That's it. That's uh, the title of my documentary, Chasing Greatness. Is it really? Yeah. Awesome. That we just finished up, but. It's for another conversation. Awesome. Well, I acknowledge you, Don. Thanks for, for being here. You're an amazing storyteller. Every time I hear from you, it's like you tell me a story that gives me chills. You give me this chills the whole time. It's like you tell a story in such a powerful way. I think that's one of your gifts. So I acknowledge you for that, for everything you're doing, and thank you for being here. Dude, you. you're my man. Thank, thank you. you. Yes.